Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's hearing. Uh, as you will see, work's been going on in the hearing room over the weekend. You're all on stage now. <laughs> I, hope, I hope it does actually improve the visibility uh, for, uh, and the audibility of, of the proceedings. Uh, if you find any of the lighting or any other aspect of problem, will you let me or one of my team know and we'll see what we can do to get it modified? Good. Yes. Sir, good morning. Um, with your permission, may I call Mr. Stephen O'Donoghue? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> yes. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much, Mr. O'Donoghue. Um, can you make sure you're? I think you may need to be a little closer to the microphone. Um, we'll see how it goes. They'll, they'll tell us if they can't hear you properly. So that, that, that'll be all right, I think. Yes, thank you. Yes, Mr. Clear. Thanks, sir. Um, would you please confirm your name? Uh, my name is Steve O'Donoghue. Um, first of all, thank you very much for coming along today to give evidence. It's very much appreciated. Um, first of all, with the procedural matters, can you confirm that you provided a witness statement to the police? I did. And if you turn to the blue folder, which is immediately in front of you, hopefully behind the first tab is a copy of that statement. Is that right? Correct. And have you read its contents recently? Uh, yes. And do you confirm the contents are true? I do. And if you turn over in that file uh, to the next tab, hopefully you'll find a copy of the contemporaneous note you prepared. Yes. I'm oh, grateful. And have you read that document recently as well? Yes. And do you confirm the contents of that yes. document are true as well? I do. Now, are you content that those documents stand as your evidence to the inquiry? Yes. <clears throat> Uh, Mr. Donoghue, because you provided a statement and a contemporaneous note, I'm not going to take you through each and every line of those documents. I just want to draw out certain topics that arise in both of them. Now, if my questions aren't clear, that's my fault. If they aren't clear, simply say so, and I'll rephrase it so I give you a clear question. Now, at any stage, if you require a break, please say so. And finally, if you feel more comfortable giving evidence in shirt sleeves, that's absolutely fine. And please don't hesitate to take your jacket off. Thank you. Now, first of all, Mr. O'Donoghue, may I deal with some um, basic facts, first of all? How long have you been a firefighter? Uh, just over 20 years. And how long have you been at Red Watch at Chiswick? 12 years. Now, the, ne the first topic I'd like to discuss with you is training and your practical experience. And if I could ask you to turn to your witness statement, the page one of that document, and the third paragraph and third line, which starts ongoing training. And it says, ongoing training as a firefighter in the LFB consists of drills, lectures, and specific training in different areas, including first aid. With regards to training for high-rise flats, we have a training site at Green Dragon Lane, which has five blocks and 24 stories for us to practice in. Now, first of all, what lectures have you received in relation to high-rise fires? Uh, after the Lacknall House uh, fire, we did a back-to-basics um, scheme where we went, I think it was Hillingdon Fire Station that we went to, uh, we did a practical session outside in how we should arrive, which equipment we should use to take up to the, the relevant, uh, not to the fire floor, but two floors below. Uh, after we did the practical, we um, had a classroom session and um, we, we were given information there to learn. Because after the Lacknell House, the, the procedures for high-rise um, policy note was changed and a policy was made. Can, um, you, can you remember now what those changes were? Uh, before, we, we, we wouldn't go up with... Uh, we'd go up to the fire floor, and if needed be, we would plug in with our 45 mil jet hose. We wouldn't do it two floors below, and that was the major change uh, for our safety, that we would plug in two floors below mm -hmm. and have enough hose to extend to the fire floor and the fire flat. 
Have you had other lectures dealing with yes. such phenomena as the Coandra effect, for example? That, 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 that was the first time I'd, I'd heard of that, where the wind uh, up the side of a high-rise building can move around like this and take the fire a lot faster up, up the side of the building. And if there's open windows with net curtains and other materials that are combustible, it, it could, and it can not only go straight up, but sideways as well. And when was the first time you'd heard of the Coando? Then. Then. Then, yes. <laughs> Had you had any lectures that deal with breach of compartmentation and how best to deal with it if there has been a breach? You, as best as I, as I can understand, you would dynamically risk assess if the fire had moved to another compartment. You would dynamically risk assess it and put in place a plan to deal with that separate fire. Now, it may well be people listening in. How would you best define a dynamic risk assessment for people who are unfamiliar taking, with the term? Taking in all the resources that you have, do you have enough manpower is there enough trucks there? And can you safely move to tackle the next fire? And would your consideration of breach of compartmentation deal with such issues as when and how to affect a partial or total evacuation from a building? No. Um, you've mentioned a number of lectures over a number of topics that you've um, been provided with. Who tends to give those lectures to usually, you? Usually it's done on... Um, at Chiswick, Chiswick Red Watch, we do our lectures on our night shifts. Um, Chris Churchill is our crew manager, uh, and he provides um, the lectures, takes the lead. Now, could I ask you to turn to page three in your witness statement? And it's the first substantive paragraph on that page, and the fourth to fifth lines, which start with the words, however. And it says, however, the flames, this is when you attended the tower, the flames appeared to be white. This made me think it was quite a hot fire with either chemicals or other substances burning. Now, what training did you receive as to how different chemicals and other substances performed when on fire? At, um, at basic training at uh, Southwark College, the first three months, they would use um, stuff like Bunsen burners to show the different mm. flame effects and the different heat and, and how pure the, um, the fuel was. But also going, going back to school, um, science uh, lectures, when they burnt magnesium, that burnt white hot and sparkled. Um, that, that, that kind of uh, history mm. sort of played a part in yeah. what I've written there. I remember Had that too. <laughs> Had you received any training on the particular risk posed by exterior cladding, for example? No, sir. No. Had you received any training uh, on the materials that could be contained within exterior cladding and how they reacted to fire? I don't believe so. Um, given your assessment on arriving at the tower that chemicals or some other substances were involved, what effect did that view have on, first of all, your assessment of whether the fire at the tower could be extinguished or contained? I was very worried. I was very worried that it couldn't be contained. When and I, when I seen the ferocity and the size of it as I first turned up on the side of the building. And was that view that you passed on to others? That was in my, your... my own personal view and opinion. And when you attended, did other, did other people express similar concerns along the lines you've just set out? Uh, yes. Um, with, uh, sh shall we say, uh, different language. Yes, but more robust yes. end of the Anglo-Saxon yes. range. Now, given your view that chemicals or other substances may be involved, yeah. what view did you take as to the need for the evacuation of residents when you attended the tower? That would not be my decision. Um, Although it may not have been your decision, did you have your own, on the basis of your own experience, form a view as to when and whether it would be necessary as, to evacuate? As, as, the, as the fire went on, as the incident continued, my own personal opinion was that, yes, I think in this case, where we're just used to fighting one compartment fire in a tower block, when I realised and seen the ferocity and the speed, that it did cross my mind that uh, a tactical with withdrawal or, or a phased evacuation w could be a good thing. On the basis not of knowing the conditions inside, though, 
And how would you conduct a phased evacuation? How would you have well, done it? I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't personally know how to go about it. Um, how, how could you possibly contact e each, of, each of the people without going and knocking on, on doors? In your, in your career thus far, had you ever had the need to effect a partial total evacuation of a high-rise building? Not, not to my knowledge. Um, Mr Donoghue, may I now ask you questions about Green Dragon Lane? Uh, yes. Um, now, will your drills um, for high-rise fires only take place at Green Dragon Lane, or do they take place somewhere else as well? Well, we've done it at Acton Fire Station um, in, in the last uh, year. I think it was another Back to Basics with um, Group Manager Ben Moore in charge. Again, we did the, the physical side first, then questions after. But it's only been once at Green Dragon Lane that did we go and, and do a drill. And it was at walk-through speed, but with the, the same brigade attendants that would normally turn up at the fire. And am I right in thinking that Green Dragon Lane is in fact a housing estate as opposed to a dedicated training site for LFBs? Answer yes. And you say there are five blocks and 24 storeys for you to practice in. Do you mean that each block has 24 storeys? Yes, sir. And, is each, um, and in terms of escape routes, are they very similar to Grenfell Tower, i.e. a single stairway? Yes, it's larger, it's wider, um, and two lifts, one for odd number flats, one for even number flats. And do any of the towers have external cladding? Well, they, they look like they were built in the 60s or 70s, and it looks like um, concrete outside with kind of stone pebble dash. Mm. I wouldn't know what was behind that exterior. And you mentioned you'd only been to Green Dragon Lane once. I've been there many times, but only once for a drill. This is what I'm talking, think, talking about drills. Mm. The drill you carried out then, did it assume a breach of compartmentation or not? No, it was just one, one fire in one flat. Mm. And it was contained within that yes. flat? Yes. Um, and did the drill include any consideration of evacuation? Not to my knowledge. It was just the practical side of the firefighting, getting the right equipment at, at the right time. And was there a search and rescue element to the drill or not? <coughs> I can't remember if it was on, on the fire floor, because I, I, I believe I was downstairs in the, in the fire lobby. Now, the next topic I'd like to turn to is the topic of Section uh, 72D visits. OK. Um, have you carried out any such visits to the Green Dragon Lane estate? Uh, yes. And uh, what did they entail? What were you looking for on each occasion? Um, Not on each occasion, but what generally were you looking for? I've been, I've been in the job, I said, 20 years. When I first started doing 7-2-D visits, we, we would check uh, times and dates of um, the firefighting media, um, extinguishers, hose reels. We would check dates on stuff like that. But now when, we, when I went... Well, I've done a 72D at um, uh, Green, Dragon. Green Dragon Lane. Uh, it, was, it was more of a familiarisation um, to the layout uh, for, for us to understand if we did have a fire, uh, we, we'd have a better understanding of, of the layout, how we would deal with it, where the dry risers is, where, where the hydrants are. Um, also, one of the, the I can't quite remember the, the name, but uh, they now have plates, and Green Dragon Lane was um, was one of the first places to have plates on the outside. The name I can't remember the name, of it, but it's information for the firefighters and the officers in charge, uh, layouts, um, where the where the stairs are, the rescue stairs. Um, and, and firefighting media and lifts. Um, did they have any information such as evacuation plans that you identified not, as possible? Not to my knowledge. Um, Paul, might I ask you to turn up policy 633, which I think the reference is, and he has that almost by magic. That, um, first of all, are you familiar with policy 633? I think we have done it in a lecture. And uh, you may recall Appendix 1, which sets out a number of points uh, relevant to Section 72D visits. Now, first of all, have you seen this particular appendix before? I can't remember, sir. 
Now, when you went on Section 72D visits, would you use a document such as this or a similar document as a checklist of things to look for? Me personally, I, the officer in charge or the crew manager would have the paperwork. Uh, we would just, I would be just told to go and check a specific thing. Um, how regularly were Section 72D visits carried out at Green Dragon Lane? Insofar as I you can't know. answer that, sir. Mr Donoghue, the next topic I want to turn to now is the night itself, your mobilisation and your journey towards the tower. Yeah. Now, it's a matter of record that you were mobilised at 1.26, on the road at 1.30 and arrived at the tower at 1.39. Does that seem right to you? That does seem right. Um, if I can ask you to turn to page three of your statement and the first uh, substantive paragraph, first line, which reads, due to heavy traffic in the area, we had to park up about 200, 250 metres away, which is about a road and a half from Grenfell Tower. Now, could I ask Paul to put up on the screens uh, mm -hmm. Met 1378. Now, if we're able to magnify that somewhat. Looking at that map now, Mr. O'Donoghue, are you able to assist us by identifying on the large screen where you remember parking up? No, sir, no. Um, you go on in the second substantive paragraph uh, back in your statement to say we parked next to a fire hydrant. Um, can you remember where that hydrant was? I can't remember the name of the road. No. Okay. Can you remember where the hydrant was? It was on the corner. On the corner of the road. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Did you encounter any problems operating that hydrant? No. The hydrant key and bar and hydrant itself had been opened and the hydrant had been shipped, i.e. the hydrant had been put in. It was just waiting to be turned on. And um, you... You don't do that until commanded. Um, if I may ask you um, to go back to your witness statement, page three, um, the second paragraph, fifth line, where it says the fire seemed to be thicker uh, towards the bottom at around the third floor level, and I assume this was where the fire had started. The fire reminded me of a Roman candle. It was about two windows width wide and six stories high. Now, given the width and height of the fire, what did that say to you about compartmentation? Well, to, they had gone into every single flat above the, the initial fire, uh, the, the initial fire flat or compartment where the fire had come out of. That's what it suggested to me. When you went to the bridgehead, yes. did you pass on that view to anyone? No. Did anyone ask you what was happening on the outside? No. Uh, could I ask you to turn to page four of your witness statement? And it's the first uh, line of the first uh, substantive paragraph on that page. At this stage, the bridgehead was on the first floor and being operated by a colleague I know, I know as Paul Watson from Hammersmith Fire Station. Now, um, could I ask Paul to put up on the screens the LFB's operational response report, uh, which is LFB quadruple zero one nine one four underscore eighty nine? And Mr. O'Donoghue, you'll see at the top of that page an entry zero one fifty eight double zero. And it says, Firefighter Dowd and Firefighter Donoghue from Chiswick, Golf 371, Chiswick's pump ladder, enter the main entrance and proceed to make an entry into the community room on the ground floor level. Does that sound about the right time? Yes. And so, in broad terms, you entered the tower roughly half an hour after arriving? Yes. Now, you mentioned that Mr. Watson was operating at the bridgehead. Uh, what do you mean by operating in this context? Well, Mr. Watson, uh, Paul Watson, is a watch manager. Uh, you would have a watch manager, um, high-ranking officer, running the bridgehead. Uh, and he was delegating jobs, telling which firefighters to what floor to go for, to go to before starting up in their BA. 
Did you understand him to be in command of the bridgehead at that moment? At the time, he was the only white helmet I could see. And did you see any FSG calls being recorded on the walls, boards, or any other surface? No. Um, Did you overhear or witness how details of FSG calls were being briefed by those operating the bridgehead to those crews who have been deployed into the tower? Um, I didn't overhear or, or, or see any, any briefings, though my brief, when I got to the, when me and Tristan got to the front of the line, uh, we were detailed that our, our job um, was an FSG call. And what were you told? We were told, Paul Watson spoke to me and Tristan and said, uh, this is an FSG call for um, flat 95 on the 12th floor. That's what I'm detailing you where, where for you to go to. Mm. Were you told how many um, residents were within that flat? No, but subsequently, I, I think I'm right in saying it, it was one adult, one child. Mm. Um, I'm, not, time, I'm not 100% on that. But can you remember whether at the time you were told that no. there was a child in the flat? No. You can't remember or you weren't told? I don't think I was told that. Um, did you see any um, firefighters carrying extended duration breathing apparatus? At this time, no. Could I ask you to turn back to page four of your witness statement and the um, first substantive paragraph at the top of that page and the second line? Um, I think the statement describes your colleague as Tristian. I think his name's Trist- Tristan, isn't it? Tristan, yeah. Um, whilst Tristan and I were in the queue, we noticed some colleagues manoeuvring a 13.5 metre ladder on the outside of the building. We were near the back of the queue, and so Tristan and I left it thinking we could help manoeuvre the ladder, because we might be needed as BA wearers during any subsequent rescue on the ladder. Initially, we tried to use the ladder whilst it was on ground level. However, it did not reach as high as it needed to go, so we lifted the ladder up onto the walkway near the entrance. It turned out that BA wearers weren't required, so we rejoined the queue leading to the bridgehead. Now, um, asking a blunt question first, Mr Donoghue, is it normal to break off from a queue and go off and do another task without being Absolutely directed? not. No. Uh, an equally blunt question, why did you do it? Um, I thought I, I could help. Uh, if I was to start up BA and the, the ladder was going into second or third floor window and there was smoke, I'd be there to help rather than to have to call someone else. I took that completely on on my shoulders and made that decision. And did you think the ladder was part and parcel of a rescue, an ongoing rescue effort? (coughs) No. Um, Had you seen any issues arising out of the positioning of the ladder itself, which instigated your your decision? Once the the ladder was was moved and we we told the team carrying it, we were here to help if, if you needed BA at the top. Two of them disappeared. I wasn't sure what their plan was, but we had to haul the 135 ladder up onto the, onto the mezzanine floor, which we've never done before. No. And did members of the public help you in that task? I don't believe that there was members of the public around. Um, were you given any information as to particular people who may be in the tower from members of the public nearby whilst you're manoeuvring the ladder? Me, no. My colleagues up on, on the mezzanine floor I believe one of them was Will Murphy from Ealing. Um, he may have have gotten information off the public up there. But as far as me and Tristan were concerned, once we'd, well, once we'd hauled the ladder aloft, we thought our job was done and we joined the line as it was, it was moving up the steps. And so you didn't see a rescue being affected or completed? No, but subsequently I do believe that Will did rescue some people. Um, when you got back to the bridgehead, did you update them on what you'd seen and the, uh, you essentially helped put a ladder up to effect a rescue? No, we didn't tell, tell anyone. Now, the next topic I want to turn to is the FSG in respect of um, flat 95 on the 12th floor. Yes, sir. And if I could ask you to turn to page four of your witness statement and the second substantive paragraph um, on that line. Um, it says, once at the bridgehead, we were tasked to go to flat 95, which is on the 12th floor, as the LFB had received a fire survival guidance call from the address. Now, we've spoken about the subject matter of the briefing that you were given. Um, could I ask Paul to put up on the screen um, MET 
Now, uh, if I might ask uh, Paul to magnify the bit of this image where you can see 1295 roughly midway down the photograph. Mr. Donahue, first question is, do you remember seeing this writing on a wall at or near the bridgehead before you went up? No. Um, are you able to assist us with any of the information which is set out next to the numbers 12 and 95? 12th floor, flat 95, which is, it seems obvious. Uh, I can't make out the rest, no. so I don't think I can help you. Are you able to assist us with what the ticks might mean? Maybe that there had been a BA team assigned to, to go and fulfil that rescue. Oh. Maybe. But you can't say for sure. Can't say for sure. Okay. Now, if I can ask you to turn to, again, the second substantive paragraph of your witness statement and the third line from the bottom. You say, once we got onto the third floor, the stairwell was smoke-logged to the extent that I couldn't see my own hand in front of my face. The stairwell itself was only about three foot wide. Um, First of all, can you remember what colour was the smoke you encountered at that stage? As, as we started up on, shall we say, the first floor, it, it was grey grey and whispery and progressively got darker. Um, on some of the floors as we progressed up, the emergency lighting wasn't working um, and that made, that made the area even darker. But it was, it was as, as if it was... We'd have moments of, cl of cl not clarity, but grey smoke, uh, that was on the, on the lower floors. As we got up, it was more consistently dark black That's very, and if, thicker. Looking at the smoke conditions you encountered as you went up from the bridgehead to the third floor, yeah. is that part of your journey? Was the smoke wispy grey and then darkening? How would you describe yeah. it? Wispy, wispy grey. And how thick was it at that stage? Sometimes I could see Tristram, my BA partner, sometimes I couldn't. Sometimes I could, I could see my lamp would hit the wall, sometimes I couldn't. Okay. And how hot was the stairwell on the third floor uh, at, at that time? At, at third floor, it, it, it was, because of all the training of fires that had been in, it was, it was bearable. And can you remember whether the door between the stairwell and the third floor lobby was open or closed at the time? I... I on my journey inside the tower, I only remember, I think, and I'm not sure what floor it was on, but it was maybe the ninth, uh, that one, one of the doors was wedged open with a halogen bar. To my knowledge, even though sometimes I couldn't see, I, I assumed the doors were closed. Um, dealing with that door that was kept open, we may come on to it later, how practical would it have been to have removed that bar thereby closing the door between the stairwell well, and the I had, lobby. Well, I, I had no idea why it was that. If, if there was a BA team that wanted, if there was slight light from the lobby, because they were going into where the front doors were to effect rescues, if it, would, if it was there to help them come out. So I, I didn't remove it. Um, do you remember at that stage, around the area of the third floor stairwell, was there any equipment or other firefighting equipment on the stairwell itself? Yes, sir. Uh, my feet was bumping in, into, mm. into equipment. Uh, are you able to give us an idea of what equipment your feet felt was touching? It felt like hoses, it felt like branches. Um, I think one was um, an, another halogen bar because of the metal clanging sound. Mm. Are you able to give us an idea of the quantity of equipment that you encountered mm. on the stairwell? It, it depended floor to floor. Some floors had, I, 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 I could have missed it, you know, walked by it. Um, it was different on each floor. Now, as you went further up tower, you came to uh, the fourth and fifth floor. Now, if I could ask you to look at the third substantive paragraph on page four, <coughs> where you say, by the stage of the fourth and fifth floor, the conditions at this stage were very dark and hot. Smoke in the stairway ranged from wispy to dark black. And there was a lot of shouting which was required by firefighters to make themselves heard. Now, where you say smoke ranged from wispy to dark black, can you help us to describe where on that stairwell between the fourth and fifth floors the smoke was wispy and where it was dark black? It, it, it changed. It was, it was ongoing. It was, it was moving. It was... Could you see where the smoke was coming from? No, no. Again, do you remember whether the door between the stairwell and the fourth floor lobby was open or closed? 
I can't remember. Um, I assumed it was closed. And again, do you remember any firefighting equipment in the stairwell on the fourth floor? I couldn't say for sure. Could I ask you to turn over the page to page five of your witness statement and the first substantive paragraph, the first four lines? At around the sixth floor, we encountered a male firefighter coming down holding a baby with his own breathing mask over the baby's face. I remember thinking, good luck, mate, and hurry up. I know what the heat and particulates you'll end up breathing in can do to you. At this stage, the lighting in the stairwell was out, and the area has only been illuminated uh, from below. Now, in relation to that passage, um, the breathing mask over the baby's face, would be a cruise, as a matter of course, carry spare masks with them? Answer no. How practicable is it for a BIA wearer to carry a spare mask with him or her? It could be done. In terms of lighting in the stairwell, how intense was the light coming from below? Oh, very, very, very small, very light. And can you remember whether any of the lighting in the stairwell above the sixth floor was working or not? To my recollection, it was, it was not working above the sixth. Okay. Can you remember on which floor the lighting stopped working? I'd, I'd say the fifth or sixth. Okay. Now, uh, staying in that same paragraph, eight lines from the bottom, um, the sentence which starts, the conditions in the stairwell, were very, uh, were very hot, and it got hotter as we ascended. On every floor, we would open the door into the lobby area to see if there were any casualties, and the lobby areas were hotter than the stairs. Now, as you ascended uh, from the sixth floor upwards, can you describe the smoke conditions as you went yeah, up now, each staircase? Now, incremental increases in thickness uh, of black smoke is no longer wispy, no longer, no longer grey. It was, it was completely can't see uh, your hand in front of your face. And again, can you describe for us the temperature as you went from the sixth floor up the tower? Yeah, it just kept increasing. Um, when you were going up each stairwell, did you open the door between the stairwell and each lobby on each floor? I don't think it was on each floor. Um, I, think we, I think we did it three times, just in case, because the, the smoke was so thick. Maybe casualties, residents had tried to come out, and if, if they'd fallen because of the breathing in it, if they were just there, we could affect a rescue, even though we knew our, our planned route was to go to the 12th. But when you opened the door yeah. and looked into each lobby, can you talk us through what you did on each and every occasion? Uh, just opened the door, looked in, felt the blast of hot air, shouted, uh, with no response, that, that's as far as we took it. And stopping there, what did you shout? Hello, anybody there? Now, at this stage, you've got a mask on. Yep. How loud are you shouting? <laughs> you don't want me to do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, was, I wasn't asking demonstration. <laughs> I, loud, I, I think I probably asked as, for that as response. As, but... as loud as I could possibly do. OK. Um, now, one of the questions that arises is, when you open <coughs> the door to each lobby, okay. Were you able to go into the lobby and check on each of the flat doors to no, double check? No, because that wasn't our directive. We, 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 were, we were doing that as just an, an extra thing to see if we could find casualties. You said you carried out that task on, you thought, three floors as you went yeah, beyond the yeah, well, it floor. wasn't every floor. Okay. What particular about those three floors caused you to open the door to check? That we were on our own and that we weren't being passed by other BA teams and that we had time to do it. Uh, when other BA teams are, are coming past, your, your concentration is with them. So when, when me and Tristan were on a, were on a floor with the lobby door, I thought, why not? And how long, how much time, can you remember now, did you spend checking those three lobbies that you did? Seconds. Now, again, in the same paragraph, you say some of the doors had been blocked open by discarded equipment, which was letting smoke in. I would say that the temperature on the stairs was around 200 degrees Fahrenheit as we went up. It was getting hotter and darker. Um, now, you say some of the doors. To be clear, we're talking about the doors between the stairwell and the lobbies. Is that right? Answer yes. Yeah. Um, again, could you tell where the smoke was coming from, the footnote? No, I couldn't. Uh, again, a question that's arisen is why wouldn't you remove 
equipment that was propping open doors. As Is it for the reason you gave earlier? Yeah, because of the reason I gave earlier. As you were going up from the sixth floor up, were you able to make out any numbers on the walls identifying no, that was, the floor? That no, was, that was the strange thing. Um, on, the, on the lower floors, where the, the emergency lighting was working, I could see, um, I could see on the walls uh, numbers. But then on other floors, e even like up to five or six, there was no numbers. So that I, I was assuming that, on, that there was... It was, it was strange to have numbers on some floors and not on others. Um, how are you keeping count of the floors you were on? Um, I, I guess it, we were just assuming. Um, could I ask you to turn to the penultimate paragraph on page five of your statement? And it says this. On the ninth floor, we checked the amount of air we had on our gauges. I was reading 90 bars and Tristan was reading about 120 bars. We both started on around 280 bars. At rest, a BA would probably last around 40 minutes. However, as we were exerting ourselves by climbing upstairs, carrying equipment both on our backs and in our arms, with the adrenaline pumping, we were using up our air quite quickly. Despite this, we carried up. At this stage, were you able to judge, given how much air you'd consumed, how much time you had left under air? left to you? When, when the BA set, if, if you're not working very hard, if it gets to uh, 84 bar, the emergency whistle uh, and electronic whistle will go off. Uh, they tell you you have 12 minutes left when that happens. Uh, which to me, as there wasn't a lot of, too much obstacles to get out, I, I think I would have been okay. So until that, until that went off, I wouldn't which you shouldn't, in, in proper procedure, you should be out before your low pressure warning whistle goes off. But in the, these incredible circumstances, we were going to carry on. And as you went up the tower, did you keep the bridgehead informed of your progress over the radio? We, we tried, but no communications would get through. Um, can you remember when the radio communications stopped working, when you couldn't I get don't, through? I right? don't think it was that they stopped working. Um, I think it was that we were getting cut off. There were so many people trying to send messages. If once you pressed the button and you were talking, then someone else would press a button, your, your message wouldn't get through, it would be stopped. So as you I think that was happening, that there were so many people trying to do communications that none were getting through. Um, as you were going up, is it right to say then that you're actually hearing radio traffic, but you bits, couldn't break just, into just, it? Yeah, just bits and pieces breaking were, up. Were you able to hear um, incoming FSGs no. by any deep men? Um, looking at uh, the, the um, bottom of page five um, of your statement, um, the st the paragraph which starts, as we got to the 11th floor, it reads this. As we got to the 11th floor, I saw Tristan walk into a man and a woman carrying towels with their eye closed. I have shouted to Tristan, Tristan, get them. Almost immediately, I have also walked into a female child with brown hair, whom I'd say was about 11 years old, wearing a white top with long sleeves and jeans. I grabbed the girl and told Tristan to grab the adults. The conditions at this stage were very hot, with thick smoke limiting visibility. Although we'd been told to go to the 12th floor, I decided we needed to save them, and if we didn't, then they and the people in Fat 95 would die where, as we could at least save these three people. Now, you'd mentioned earlier that the temperature on the stairs was around 200 degrees Fahrenheit in your, yeah. in, in your estimate, and at the top of page six, the conditions at the stage were very hot. Was it obviously hotter in or about the 11th floor than it had been below the 11th floor? Yes, sir. Was the smoke denser or much the same? It was, it was denser. And again, what colour was the smoke? Black. Again, just to try and get some detail on this, could you see where the smoke was coming from? No, sir. Now, turning to the family that you encountered, the individuals that you encountered, can you remember whether there was a child on the adult male's back or not? I don't believe so. Um, were the adults you helped to go down the tower, um, were they able to do it under their own steam or did you or Tristan have to help out? Um, as, we, as we came to the adults, the girl, and it was like, it was like just a small um, 
moment of clarity within the black smoke um, to see their faces and we couldn't believe that we'd come across them in, in the smoke. As I said, I shouted to Tristan to get the adults. Uh, obviously the more vulnerable person being the child. So I just immediately dropped my equipment, which was a hose and a branch to the right, grabbed the child up onto my hip, my left hand on the inside rail, shouted to Tristan, I've got the child, you get the adults. Right. I thought, being a child, I thought more vulnerable, I have to get down fast. And I knew that would break our BA team up, but I wanted to get the child down as fast as possible. Yeah. And as you were going, can you remember at which floor the conditions started to get less smoky and less hot? Probably about four. Can you remember uh, the time at which you reached the bridgehead again? Well, the, t to my recollection, it was strange because the, the bridgehead was, uh, it seemed to have been moved from, from where we went in, it was now higher up. And where did you encounter it as you went down? I think it was the third. Hmm. And what were, what were the conditions like on the third floor in terms there of there was still heat? There was still uh, wispy smoke down there. Um, it surprised me, though, to, to come across it because radio communications hadn't worked. No one had got through to us that, you know, the bridgehead had been moved. And when you decided you you were going to take the group of uh, individuals down the tower, mm -hmm. were you able to radio the bridgehead to tell them this is what you were doing and effectively you were breaking off from the I rescue? Mission? I tried once and that was it. I didn't try again because we'd been un unsuccessful in our communications beforehand. I didn't see why it would work this time, but I did try. Um, could I ask Paul to turn up the telemetry data, which I think is at LFB quadruple zero three double one five. Mm. And Paul, could I ask you to magnify box 70, 70? around 70, I should say. Mm -hmm. Now, you'll see at box 70, reading across from left to right, Chiswick, Dowd, Tristan, and at the far right, you've got Tally out at 0220. If you look at the box immediately above, mm -hmm. you'll see a name Carl El Sharif. Now, is Carl El Sharif based at Chiswick? He is. He's on the Blue Watch. Yeah. Were you Tristan's only partner that evening? Yes, I was. Yes. Um, is it possible that the BA equipment has identified the wrong person there? Yes. And um, if I could ask Paul if you could extend the scope of the Excel spreadsheet so we can see the end of wear time uh, for boxes 69 and 70. And on the assumption that you are Carl El Sharif, <laughs> you'll see end of wear time, I think, reading across 024036 and Tristan 0241. Does that sound about right to you, Mr. Sounds about right. Um, could I now ask you about um, once you'd got back to the bridgehead? Now, if I ask you to turn to page six of your witness statement, the first substantive paragraph, um, four lines up from the end, it says, we informed the female officer manning the bridgehead that we'd carried out a rescue, but we hadn't been able to get to flat 95. I'm not sure what she did with this information. I also informed governors that were around, distinguished by their white helmets, and put the message over the radio channel. Um, can you remember whether the female officer recorded the result of this rescue? I believe she wrote it down on, on a piece of paper. Um, I've consulted with my colleague Tristan on this, and he 100% agrees with me that she did. We know who she was. Uh, she was you remember who she was? Yeah, she was the watch manager from Chelsea. With I can't Silvo? believe. Uh, yes. Yeah. And do you know what she did with that bit of paper? Were you I there? I don't you? know what she did with that paper, but as you can imagine, um, the worry over, over the the rest of the incident and, and weeks later that our job to go to, the ninth, to go to the 12th floor wasn't fulfilled. Whilst giving my statement, the police officer looked into it, into it and assured me that um, the people from flat 12 had been rescued, That's right. which was a great relief. And so I assume 
the information that we passed to her was passed on because a rescue happened. Mm -hmm. And were you given any further orders by De Silva? Uh, not that I can remember. Um, did you report any uh, the the conditions you'd encountered as you'd gone up to the tower? I don't believe so. Um, going back to a sort of more general question about conditions, um, can you describe the effects on hearing whilst you're wearing the BA equipment? Um, Essentially, how easy is it to hear? Uh, you can hear. The actual breathing mask itself doesn't cover your ears, but you have a flash hood, if there was a flash hood, to cover any exposed skin. So it, it's a piece of co cotton cloth. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it's, it's just the cloth over the ears. So it, your, your hearing is impeded, but not so much that, um, not, not so much that it, it mm -hmm. makes such a difference. Mm -hmm. So you don't feel it impedes your ability no. to hear no. people calling out for assistance? No. Um, could I ask you to turn to page seven of your witness statement in the first uh, paragraph, penultimate line, which says, Tristan and I discussed <coughs> what we should do next when we decide to set up a casualty handling area near the tower. Um, now, um, did you seek out any LAS, that's London Ambulance Service staff, before setting up their handling area? Um, no, and I, it's something, at, on, a, on a normal, if there ever is a normal fire, uh, you, you, it was something that would be set up. I hadn't seen anything set up close to the tower on the side that we broke out mm. of, and I thought that was the next best thing. Not that I was told to do it by an officer, mm. but just 20 years' experience to, to do it. Um, it was later on, once we set up the casualty handling area with IEC packs and water and a salvage sheet, that the LAS, because we were about, we were probably only 50 metres away from the tower. We had some protection from about a 12 foot high wall, um, but, then, but then that area then became the, it was like a triage for the ambulance. Um, and I'm afraid also at the start it was, it was an area for the body bags. Before you set up the, the handling area, yes. did you try and identify a suitably senior LAS officer who you could double check that? It's not, not, not something that you do, no. And did you um, consider contacting the command unit to uh, say what you were doing? Maybe I should have done, but no, I just got, I just got on with it. Um, did you, um, were you able to identify any emergency medical services around the base not, of not the tower? At, no, not. You say the base of the tower, I, I was only at one side. One side? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, could I ask you about the ventilation system and ask you to turn to page nine of your statement? And it's the first substantive paragraph on that page, um, the third line. The smoke management system obviously wasn't working, as in the stairwell, as I couldn't see my hand in front of my face due to the thickness um, of the smoke. Um, were you aware of the ventilation system working at any time during your no, sir. time in the tower? No, sir. Um, Mr. Donoghue, there are some further matters which I've been sort of asked to ask you if, if that's all right. Um, one resident um, at the tower remembers helping a firefighter moving a ladder onto the walkway. Okay. Um, do you remember a, a slim BME male individual helping anyone uh, with a ladder? No, sir. When you were manoeuvring the ladder, going back to that point, did you feel that there were insufficient number of firefighters there for the task? At that time, no, I didn't. And why? Did, why did you think? I, I, I thought <clears throat> when we came when we came out of um, Chiswick Fire Station on, on the call on the radio, I heard make pumps ten. Halfway there towards Shepherd's Bush, I heard make pumps uh, twenty five. And then as we arrived. And just before we got off the machine, I heard make pumps 40, uh, which is a lot of staff that's mm. going to be there. So at, at, at that time then, once the incident moved on, um, and as you're saying, the manoeuvring of the ladder uh, and the amount of B BA wearers I could actually see when I, when I came out after having my BA wear, I thought at the time there was enough resources. But um, obviously didn't... On the benefit of your experience of two decades plus, yeah. would it have been practical to use ladders to affect more rescues during the course of the Only year? up to as high as they can go, because the 135 one, one, ladder will only go up 
as its name suggests, 13.5 metres, our nine metre ladder goes up um, to nine metres. Hmm. Yeah. Mr Donoghue, I've only got probably about five more minutes worth of questions. Are you content for me to go through that five minutes yes, and then, sir, with I the am. Chairman's permission, we can take a break? No, you, Mr Chairman, you, sir, you, I'd like to carry on. You'll have to keep on. going. Yes, yes, we'll do that. Then. Thank you. Okay. Um, another resident, uh, on the night of the fire, he assisted a firefighter moving a ladder onto the walkway again. Do you remember seeing a, a second slim BME man? No, I don't, with, sir. Okay. Now, um, could I ask you to turn back to page eight of your witness statement? And the third substantive paragraph on that page, the first sentence, which says the gas board has arrived as they had to turn off the gas supply to the tower as blue fires were happening in the flats from where gas pipes had burst. The gas board had about eight tenders, including JCBs, to dig up the road and turn off the gas. Um, first of all, can you remember what time the gas this, board this, attended? I would say this is in the afternoon. I would say roughly it is maybe three or four o'clock okay. in the afternoon. Um, what are blue fires? <laughs> what we could see on the building, um, the building was now charred and black, mm. uh, but there was, there was blue flame, as you would get, as I mentioned earlier, from a Bunsen burner. There was blue flame coming from like the left-hand side where the gas intake, I guess the pipe going mm. up the building, had burst at certain uh, areas. And that was, that was quite visible. Did you see any of the blue fires yourself? Only, only on the outside. And can you remember where they were located? In the it tower? seemed it seemed to be at the apex of the corner. O on what on, on, on I would say on about three floors. Which floors? Can you remember now? I mean, above middle. Okay. Hmm. Do you know what steps have been taken to shut off the gas supply before the gas board attended? Answer no. Um, looking at the second sentence there, um, are you able to explain what tenders you saw? Uh, JCBs, transit vans, other transit vans, uh, and maybe a flatbed lorry. Okay. Um, can I just go back to one point just to clarify matters? You mentioned earlier on your evidence that there was a halogen bar blocking a door. Yeah. Was that on the third or the ninth floor, can you remember? I think it was the ninth. The ninth, thank you. So that might be a convenient right. moment for a break, so it's your permission, sir. Yes. Have you got more questions for Mr Donoghue? I've got Donahue? no questions, but it might be... There might be some more that emerge. Yes. Right. Mr Donoghue, we're going to have a short break now, 10 minutes or so. Um, please don't talk to anyone about your evidence during the break. Uh, I'm going to ask you to come back at 10, at 10 o'clock. No, 11 o'clock, sorry. Come back at 11 o'clock. We'll see if there are any more questions at that point. Okay. There may or may not be. OK, right. thank, thank you, you Mr Chairman. Would you like to go to the usher, please? Right, we'll break that until 11 o'clock, please. OK, yes, sir.
All right, Mr. Donoghue. Yes, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. Thank you. Mr. Clear. Uh, Mr. Donoghue, thank you very much for your patience. Just have one question for you. Um, the error in relation to the telemetry data, where you appear to be Mr. Al Sharif in, in, in the data sheet, are you able to explain the error or provide some possible explanations for that? Yes, error? After, after you test your set, you have a log book that you, you have to sign to say that you tested your set. For some reason, being distracted, I haven't signed that book, and it was the previous wearer's name still in it. Thank you very much. Mr. O'Donoghue, thank you very much for coming today to answer my questions. Thank you, sir. Thank you, well, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Donoghue, that's all we've got for you. Thank you very much indeed for coming to give your evidence. It is really helpful for us to know about your experience inside the tower, and we're very grateful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Right, if you'd like to go with the other. You can go. Thank you. Now, Mr. Kinnear. Mr. Gillam is the next witness, uh, sir. He has asked to stand whilst giving his evidence. So I'm afraid there right. has to be some. So we need a bit of adjustment of furniture. It does, sir. So apologies for the irritation. No, no, that's all right. I might ask you to rise so they. Those changes can be done and then yes. invite uh, you to return. I'll, I'll rise for five minutes for as long as it takes. Thank you, sir. Right. Thank you.
Yes, Mr Kinney, I think we're ready now. I think we are. May I call Martin Gillam? Yeah. Sincerely and truly, declare and affirm, declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give, the evidence that I shall give, shall be the truth, shall be the truth, the whole truth, the, tr the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Nothing but the truth. Thank you very much, Mr. Gillam. I gather you'd rather stand to give your yes, evidence. Yes, please, sir. Yeah. Yes, well, just make yourself as comfortable as you can, then. Thank you. Um, Mr. Kinnear will have some questions. Yes, Thanks, Mr. sir. Um, would you please confirm your name, uh, Martin Gillam? Uh, thank you very much for coming to give evidence today. It's very much appreciated. Now, you have provided a witness statement and a contemporaneous note. Now, if you turn to the blue bundle in front of you, hopefully behind the first tab, you'll find your statement dated the 21st of December 2017. That's correct. And have you read that document recently? Yes, sir. And its contents true? Yes, sir. And could you turn to the next tab and hopefully you'll find a contemporaneous note? Yes. And have you read that document recently? Yes. And the contents true? Um, yes. And are you content that both those documents stand as your evidence to the inquiry? Yes, sir. Um, now, because you provided a detailed statement and a contem contemporaneous note, I'm not going to take you through each and every line of those documents, but simply to discuss particular issues with you. Now, if at any time you want a break, please say so. Also, if you're more comfortable giving evidence in shirt sleeves, that's not a problem either, just say so. Now, finally, on housekeeping matters, if any of my questions are unclear, the problem is mine, please say so, and I'll rephrase the question so it's clearer. Now, um, can I start with some uh, basic details? Uh, you've been a firefighter for nine years and been with the LFB since 2011, is that right? That's correct. And at the time of the fire, you were based at Paddington. That's correct. And uh, you're still based at Paddington, is that right? Yes. Now, could I uh, now turn to consider the issue of your training and practical experience? And could I ask you to turn to page three of your witness statement? And the second paragraph uh, there. seconds, which says, I think there are 12 FRUs in the brigade. They carry more specialist equipment. They're more likely to attend road traffic collisions, incidents on the tubes, etc. There are different skills across, across the brigade, but our skill here at Paddington is line rescue. And then, next paragraph, to work on the FRU, you have to be a competent firefighter like I am. You either come to an FRU station or you'll transfer into one like I did. Then you have to do a fire rescue unit course, which is a three-week course, and there's also a separate three-day EDBA, extra duration breathing apparatus course. On this course, they teach you about the EDBA set, which is practically the same. There are just a few differences. Um, first of all, are you able to give us an idea of the detailed substance of the FRU training you undertook? Um, the FRU course is a three and a half week course. Uh, I did mine based at Park Royal Training Centre. Um, and that covers the different equipment that's carried on the fire rescue unit. Um, we have it's slightly different equipment on there, more uh, heavy duty uh, uh, gear for attending road traffic collisions. There's, on our particular appliance, we carry line rescue equipment. That's our skill at Paddington. Um, and other sort of uh, incidents for attending train, train crashes. Um, things for uh, police systems, things like that, so the course entailed going through each of the uh, bits of kit on the truck, uh, going through it, then we do practical stuff with it, training with it, a uh, mixture of lectures in the classroom and practical based in the yard, and at the, at the end of that course you do a written exam and a, and a practical exam. Uh, is there a high-rise element to the training you provide on the FRU course? Answer no. Um, apart from the difference in duration, in terms of their use, what are the principal differences between EDBA and standard duration breathing apparatus? Um, an EDBA set will be used for um, longer duration wears, for example, uh, maybe something involving sewer rescue, uh, the, where the travel distance and the travel time between the entry control point and 
the scene of operations is longer, uh, we'd utilise extended duration breathing apparatus. Um, the difference is being it's a heavier set, I think it weighs about 12 kilos more. Um, it's got an extra cylinder on the back which are attached, which obviously gives you the extra volume of air. Um, but in terms, the, the principles are very much the same, the testing is the same, and the layout of the, the bodyguard, the mask, is all identical. Um, when you're wearing EDBA, will you carry a spare mask in the event that it's needed for someone you rescue, for example? Answer no. Would it be practicable for you to carry a spare mask when you're deployed uh, with your EDBA kit? You could do, yes. Um, listening to what you say, is it fair to say that someone who is trained in the use of SDBA would also be able to use EDBA without too much difficulty? I'll say yes to that. Um, going back to your statement at page... Sorry, can I just... Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, Mr. King. Um, <coughs> If, if you were to carry a spare mask, how easy is it to attach a spare mask to the existing set? Um, it's very easy, sir. We, on, the, on the BA set itself, we have what's called a second person connection, which if okay. uh, a firefighter becomes either unwell or entrapped in an um, irrespirable atmosphere, we can bring in a spare set. Um, and that spare set, if, if there's nothing wrong with their actual the set that they're wearing, we can plug in the spare mask into what's called second person connection. There's a separate right. hose for it. Okay. Um, so if we had the spare mask, in theory, a casualty, we could put the mask on a casualty, which I think was done on the night by a colleague of mine, and then uh, plugged into the second person um, connection on the set. That's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, turning back to page two of your witness statement and the fourth paragraph, the last three lines, um, you mentioned there the incident at Trellick Tower. You said the only reason we went to Trellick was because the water didn't work, so we went to look at the procedures and what we would do in that situation again. Now, in terms of learning points, what did you take away from the Trellick Tower fire? Um, in terms of accuracy, that statement there's a little bit wrong. I was on duty that night, but I was riding the fire rescue unit. We didn't attend Trellick Tower, the fire at Trellick Towers, but I did attend the, uh, the visit that came afterwards due to the problems with the wet riser, but I know I'm familiar with the job because my watch attended it. Uh, what learning points did you take away? You attended to look at the wet riser, um, is that right? Yeah, we attended to look at the wet riser and what would, what would happen if that happened again and it, would we make use of potentially lightweight portable pumps in the uh, stairwells and other means of getting water to the higher floors if that happened again? Uh, did you look at any other aspect of high-rise firefighting pr uh, procedures and techniques? Answer no. Uh, Mr Gillam, I'd like now to talk about the night, your mobilisation and arrival at the scene. Now, if we can just look at some basic facts, first of all, it's a matter of record that you were mobilised at 1.20, on the road at 1.22, and arrived on the scene at 1.35. Did that seem right to you? Answer yes. Um, on the night, you were in the FRU at Paddington, and the call sign's Alpha 216, is that right? That's correct. And you were riding with crew manager Phil Wigley and firefighters Roberts, Gonzalez and Harris, is that right? That's correct. Um, and if, Paul, could you put up on the screen um, LFB quadruple zero one nine one four underscore 100, and the second box from the top... Is that the type of FRU you were riding on the night? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, for the avoidance of doubt, and so people understand, what are the principal functions of an FRU? Um, an FRU uh, is a rescue unit, so it doesn't imp uh, carry ladders and it doesn't have any water on board. It doesn't have hoses or branches on board. It's not necessarily for firefighting. It carries a larger range of equipment. Uh, more complex incidents, um, road traffic collisions, train crashes, people under trains, um, that incidents of that nature. And at Paddington, we have line rescue as a skill, so we might get called to a person threatening to jump or someone stuck up a crane, incidents like that. Would it carry uh, bits of kits such as ground monitors and lightweight portable pumps? Answer no. Um, turning back to page four of your witness statement and the first substantive paragraph, the fourth line, um, you say this, a message had come up on the MDT that said FRU was no longer required, so we pulled over for a minute. Then Phil, 
Wigley just clarified it on the main scheme radio call controller. Do you still require us for this incident? And they said yes, proceed. Now, you say you pulled over for a minute. Uh, can you now remember more precisely how long it took for the clarification to be sought and yeah, provided? Um, I, I can remember that part specifically. Um, the FYU was mobilised on the make pumps at eight along with the, what, the pump ladder which Watch Manager Collins was riding, and we were behind the pump ladder on our way to the incident. Um, and on the handheld radio, the governor got over that a message had appeared on the MDT that we were no longer required. I can see that message as I'm riding in the back of the truck. Um, so Phil, who was in, uh, crew manager Wigley, was in charge of that truck that night. We, we pulled over, he got uh, control on the main scheme radio. And just to clarify whether we were still required to attend, they said answer, answer yes. So that whole process probably took around two minutes. Now, uh, in terms of its operation, how reliable is the MDT? Uh, normally pretty reliable. Now, if I can now turn to the question of access problems, the second half of page four of your witness statement and most of page five, you set out in detail the, the various parked cars, etc., that hindered um, your access to the tower. Can you now remember how long it took you to manoeuvre around these various obstacles? Um, I'd say at least two to three minutes. The, the FIU is slightly longer at the back, maybe another metre or so, uh, 1.5 metres long, longer than a normal appliance. And uh, Dean was driving and he couldn't get round the turn, so we had to bounce two cars out the way on the corner, so a couple of minutes at least. Um, looking back at page five, the final paragraph and six lines up from the bottom, you say the hydrant was on the corner of Grenfell Road and Bowmore Road on the right. Um, once the hydrant was operational, uh, do you know what the water pressure was like? Was it adequate or not? I can't answer that. I, I helped um, lay out the, the, the hose for the pump from the hydrant. I didn't um, t test the hydrant before it was plugged in. Now, I'd like to ask you questions about the nature of the fire that you perceived when you first arrived at the tower. And could I ask you to look at page five and the second substantive paragraph on that page, line four onwards. And you said this, you could see the fire was spreading up the building, but it just looked like it was external because it was just external. It just looked like it got the cladding. Now, did you think the cladding was involved at the time? Yes. And what was it about your knowledge of cladding uh, that allowed you to form that view? I could see the rest of the building and I could see that the, that window and the window directly above it were involved. And, um, that something was burning above it, and obviously looking at the rest of the building, I could identify that that was cladding that was alight. And are you aware that one of the purposes of cladding is waterproofing? Yes. Yeah. And that because of that, um, is it your view that it would be difficult to get water to penetrate the cladding in order to extinguish any fire or contain any fire? I don't know. I wouldn't want to speculate on that. Staying with this paragraph, the final three lines, I honestly thought we would get it. The turntable ladder was going to put water on that and it's going to go. When they said about the line, I thought, oh yeah, we'll be able to get that. Now, to be clear, the phrase, we would get it, do you mean extinguish the fire? I see, yes. Now, given the rate of spread of the fire you'd noticed over the course of 10 minutes or so, why did you think the turntable ladder would succeed in extinguishing the fire? Um, Looking at the statement, the way that's written, um, my opinion was that the TL would put water on from the, from the bottom as far as it could reach, and that our job from the roof with the line would be putting water down onto the job. So with the, two, with the t water coming from underneath and above, I thought we'd get it. Okay. And when you're talking about the line here, to be clear, what are you talking about? Sorry, um, like I said, our, our skill at Paddington is line rescue, so line is it's a, a brigade terminology for rope. So we basically make ourselves safe using rope. Um, and when you say, I thought, oh yeah, we will, be able, we will be able to get that, what did you mean by that? That we'd be able to put it out. Now, turning over the page to page six, um, the last paragraph, um, you say this at the bottom of the page. After the hydrant and hose, Phil Wigley came back and said they wanted us to go into the tower and use lineups, which is rope access, which we were trained to do on the FRU. They said they wanted us to go to the roof 
find a strong anchor point, tie ourselves off, make ourselves safe, so if we did slip, we are not going to fall to the floor, and then put a jet down from the top of the tower and spray it down because obviously it was starting to take the cladding and the TL couldn't throw the water high enough to reach the top. I don't know who gave Phil that order, I just do as I'm told. Uh, just to complete it, so we looked at it and at the time it was a couple of flats going and a bit of the cladding on the outside, but it looked like a doable job. We thought, yeah, we could do that. Now, um, given what you'd already seen of the fire spread, what risks did you identify at the time that flowed from applying the line as a means of firefighting? Um, do you mean risks to ourselves as firefighters? Risks to yourselves primarily, yes. Uh, well, in general, line's not used where there's fire, obviously, because it burns. Um, but looking at the job as a, as a group, as a team, we, we thought it was, a, it was an achievable task. Um, and obviously, you have to take a certain element of risk in the, in the nature of the job, and especially at that instant. Did you question the, util the feasibility of uh, the task? No. Did others question the feasibility no. of that? I mean, if I've understood it correctly, the, uh, <coughs> the purpose of the line was really to tie you onto the building when you got That's to correct, the top, sir. The, purpose, right? the purpose of the line would be to, um, we've got three systems that we can use, work restraint, positioning and fall arrest, so basically we, can, we took all the equipment that we needed, to the, the aim was to get to the roof, um, identify what we had to maybe use as tie-off points or whatever, make ourselves, make ourselves safe, mm -hmm. and then we were going to lean over, charge the jets and try and put water down onto the job. So, so you There's would also have had to get hose up to the roof of the building as well? We took hose with us, sir, yes. So the, the line is there, was there for our protection. And the, reason, and the reason why line isn't ordinarily used in fire situations is the obvious one it burns. I'll see it. Now, beyond what you could see with your own eyes, what information did you have regarding any fire spread within the tower itself at the time you were tasked to go up to the roof? Uh, no information, sir. Okay. Uh, did you have any information regarding conditions on the roof itself? No. Uh, did you have any information regarding the means of access to the roof? No. Uh, or whether it was obstructed by means of a gate or any other device? The next topic I'd like to discuss is your arrival at the bridgehead itself. And could I ask you to turn to page seven of your witness statement in the first substantive uh, paragraph, where you say, um, so we walked into the tower, loads of stuff falling everywhere. We got to the bridgehead, which was just on the mezzanine at this point. The bridgehead is a thing we set up on high-rise instance, a control point. In charge of that was watch manager Brian O'Keefe from Kensington. We told him we were briefed to go out, to go onto the roof. We made the decision that we would try and get up onto the roof, and then what we would do, we would start up and go under air on the roof. If we go under air there and go all the way up to the top, we would have nothing left because it would smoke at the top. So we knew we would have to be under air to lean over the top to put the water down, because obviously it's going to be coming right in our face. So we told Brian what we were doing, and then we tried to go up not under air. We said that to Brian, and he said, yeah, I don't really want you to do that, but go on. We all had EDBA sets on our back, which are extended duration breathing apparatus. They got two cylinders on rather than one, which are carried on the normal truck, so we have longer. So we had them on our backs as well, plus all the gear. Now, at that stage, where was the bridgehead? On the mezzanine, um, on the mezzanine floor. You go into the tower, turn to your right, there's a, a, like a glass staircase, and the mezzanine, on the mezzanine walkway, just at the entrance to that. What briefing did Mr O'Keefe give you regarding conditions within the tower at that stage? None. I, d I told him what, we, what, our, what we'd been tasked with, what Phil had been tasked with by the officer in charge. Um, I know, I've known Brian a long time, he's been my governor, and he had, there, he had a lot going on then at that time, so I tried to make his job a bit easier and just told him what we were planning on doing. Did Mr Wigley or any member of your crew ask Mr O'Keefe what conditions were like in the stairwell? I can't answer that. I was at the front. Someone at the back might have asked that question, but I didn't hear it. Did you hear any question being asked regarding conditions on the roof, for example? No. Um, when just, you just on that point, sorry, sir, because we saw the job from the outside before we went in, 
we assumed nothing was alight on the roof because we could see at what height the fire had reached and it hadn't reached the roof at that time. So, mm. um, Were you assuming at that stage that the fire was static or not? Can you explain what you mean? Uh, were you assuming that the fire would remain where it was when you saw it from the outside? Yes. Can I ask why did you assume that, well, given the spread and the ten minutes well, you perceived yeah, well, it from outside? To say if we assumed, I'm just talking about my personal opinion, not necessarily that of the whole crew. Um, we could see that it was rising, but we, obviously we, at that point we were on the inside of the bridgehead. Coming out afterwards, we'd, we'd seen the scale of the spread, but at that time we, weren't, we didn't have that information it was spreading at that speed. So we, yeah, it'd be fair to say that we thought we could get to the roof and it would, it would be worse, but not as bad as it obviously became. And uh, when you told Mr. O'Keefe about the task to go up to the 23rd floor, can you remember the precise words he used in response or the gist of the words he used? Um, I think it'd be unfair to speculate. There was a lot going on, a lot of shouting. Um, to remember a specific sentence, no. Okay. Now, in the... Um, the paragraph I've quoted, you say Mr Keefe said, yeah, I don't really want you to do that, but go on. Can you remember, did he not want you to go to the roof or was it he didn't want you to not commit under air? Um, I told him we were going to the roof. Um, he didn't want, particularly want us to go in not under air. So sort of expanding on what's said in that part, the idea was that we would go to the roof not under air because obviously we need the air up there, not realising that we'd also the internal conditions at that time. Um, so the idea was we'd get to the roof, not under air, and then our sets were on our back, but then we'd actually put the face masks on to protect us from breathing in the smoke that would be rising up. And as you were the first EDBA crew to be present at the bridgehead, um, did you have a conversation with Mr O'Keefe or anyone else regarding prioritisation of tasks? No. Um, now, could I ask you now to, we're going to discuss conditions on the fourth floor as you went up the tower. And on page seven, on the final paragraph of that page, the first sentence starts, so we went up to the fourth floor. Now, presumably you went from the bridgehead up the stairwell to the third floor. Is that a fair assumption? Yes. Now, can you describe what conditions were like in the stairwell when you first entered it? Um, I'd say grey smoke, but not... Wispy smoke, not that hot. How thick was it? Not that thick. You could see, I could see my crew. Um, you went up to the fourth floor. Did you enter into the, from the fourth floor stairwell into the fourth floor lobby at any time? Answer no. Um, could you tell where the smoke was coming from? No. Can you remember, apologies, it's a difficult question, how long you spent on the fourth floor stairwell before deciding to return back to the bridgehead? I'm oh, sorry, you're talking about... Yeah, so we made our way up to the fourth. It became apparent pretty quickly that the conditions weren't going to allow us to get to the roof, uh, not under air. So I'd say that was a matter of... The, dis the travel distance between the bridgehead and the fourth and back down, you're talking maybe a minute, maybe two. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, you obviously returned to the bridgehead, yes. put the EDBA on, Yes. Tallied out. And if I could ask Paul to turn so up... The, the ED bay was already on. We just already put, on. We just put the masks on. Put the mm -hmm. mask on. Yeah. Um, could I ask Paul to turn to the telemetry data, LFB quadruple zero three double one five and box 40. And you'll see, hopefully there, if that could be magnified a bit more, the tally out time appears to be 1.56. Does that sound about right? Answer yes. Um, did you inform when you returned to the bridgehead, did you inform Mr O'Keefe or anyone else of the conditions you'd encountered on the stairwell going up to the fourth floor? Yes, we had a brief conversation along the lines of, right, it's too smoky, we've got to go under air, okay. something along those lines, mm -hmm. and he said, go on then. Okay. And did you have that, who of your crew had that conversation? Me. With Mr O'Keefe? Yes. Now, um, if I, next topic is your second attempt to go up the tower. And if I could ask you to turn to page nine of your witness statement, um, the first paragraph, first sentence, which says, so we've started going up again from the mezzanine and it's proper smoky, but it's not too hot at this point. It's hot, but not too bad. The stairwell was narrow from the railing to the wall is about a meter and a half. Um, to be clear, are you saying that immediately on leaving the bridgehead, 
uh, on the mezzanine conditions had become smoky and hot? Uh, no. Sorry, that's a bit confusing. Um, it was like it was to be smoke, not, not, not at the bridgehead. Like immediately when you went up to the next floor, maybe the third or the fourth, you, you'd get to the, the uh, grey wispy smoke again. Um, if we could look at the second paragraph on page uh, 9. You say, so we got to about the 11th and 12th floor. Now, stopping there, can you describe smoke conditions as you went from the 4th up into the 11th floors? Uh, they got worse. I'd say visibility was reduced, but partially because, partly because there wasn't much lighting. Um, you could make out the outlines of your crew. You couldn't really see them that well. But I remember um, making out firefighters Mills and Campbell because we know them. And can you remember what colour the smoke was as you ascended up the tower? Grey. And can you describe the temperature as you went from the 4th to the 11th floor? Did it stay constant, or did it increase or decrease? I can't remember, sorry. Um, you mentioned lighting in the stairwell. As you went from the 4th to 11th floor, can you remember whether the stairwell was lit all the way up or partially? It wasn't lit. I'd say after about the 4th floor there was, there was no lighting. Now, when you met um, Mills and Campbell, did you talk with either or both of them? Yes. And uh, what did, who started the conversation? Was it you or they? Um, I think that bit's a bit of a blur, but I can remember Millsy telling me that um, they couldn't get to the lady they aimed to rescue on the 20th floor, um, but he was running out of air, so they were going out. And did they give you the flat number? No. Did they give you any further details regarding the lady who they were seeking to rescue? No. no. Was there any mention whether she was vulnerable or not? No. I, at, that, at that point, our plan wasn't to go to the 20th floor. We were, we were going to stick to our brief, which was to make it to the roof. Now, on page 9, the bottom half of the page, you describe your progress um, up the tower. As you went from the 11th up until the 15th or 16th floors, can you describe the smoke conditions as you went between those floors? I'd say they got um, a little bit worse, but that might be due to, I'm trying to remember, but that, obviously we were fatiguing at that point. We've obviously climbed 15 step flights with the equipment we're mm -hmm. carrying, so um, I'd say no, sorry. No. Can you remember much about the temperature? Not really, no. Can you remember whether any of the doors from the stairwell to individual lobbies were open or not? I don't recall seeing any open at that time, at that height, anyway. Now, somewhere between the 15th and 16th floors, on the, you've decided there was no realistic prospect of getting to the roof. Is that a fair summary? Yes. Yeah. And what were the principal reasons why you came to that view? Because um, initially the plan was to get up there not under air, so we... The reason was we, we have to allow a turnaround time in our sets, a safety margin, to get back down and out safely. So um, we realised pretty quick that we won't be able to get up onto the roof, carry out the task we've been given, and get down all in the same way of that particular set. When, when you came to that decision as a crew, um, can you remember, for example, how much air you had left? Uh, I didn't take a gauge reading at that time. I can't remember that. Can you remember in terms of minutes how much air you thought you had left? We'd be, it felt like we'd been there about 15 minutes, so I, I knew that we had, we'd have another 20 minutes, maybe. And who suggested that you change tack and seek to rescue uh, the lady that Mills had informed you about? Me. And did the other crew members agree with that? Um, at the time, I thought I did, um, having discussed it. I think a few weren't aware, but I... I remember specifically thinking that we need to get up there to get the, uh, the lady that they couldn't rescue. Uh, could I ask you to turn to page 10 of your statement in the first substantive paragraph, the fourth line? You say, we try to radio down because when you change your brief or you're doing something different, entry control should know about it. We radio down a couple of times and nothing because either they weren't getting us or we weren't getting them. It's a concrete building, so comms are notoriously bad. On your way up the tower, had you received any information via the radio, excuse me, regarding FSG calls? No. 
Um, had you heard any particular FSG calls before you went up regarding residents on the 20th and 21st floors? No, I, I think it's fair to say I, I didn't have com I had a handheld radio, but I didn't have a, a Barry set on that night, so I wouldn't have been able to hear them anyway. Okay. May I ask why, why you wouldn't have had a Barry set on that night? Um, across the machine, there's five EDBA sets. Two of them would have had Barry on. Uh, you don't need them on every set. Um, and so two of the crew would have had Barry, and um, I wasn't one of them. Can you remember of your crew who had the Barry set? I think it was Firefighter Gonzalez and Crew Manager Wiggly, but I can't confirm that. When, um, who would have been radioing down to, the, uh, to entry control? One of the, ones, one of the crew oh. with the Barry set. And are you able to help us? Was, there, was it that there was no response at all, or was it that they couldn't crack through the traffic, or what? I'm not sure. I remember um, when uh, Crew Manager Wiggly said that it, that wasn't our brief, we discussed that we just radioed down and let them know that we were changing what we were doing. I don't know if they got a response back from that. Um, if comms are notoriously bad in concrete buildings, when there's a change in task or brief, as happened here, how do you inform the bridgehead or entry control of that change, or indeed where you are? Um, well, this is obviously quite a unique incident in terms of travel distance and breakdown in comms, but uh, if, if it was a, a house job, for example, you might be able to make your way to a window, shout to them, let them know what you're doing, but in this particular instance, we didn't have any way of doing that. Now, if the next topic I'd like to discuss with you is your arrival on the 20th floor itself. And again, if I could ask you to turn to page 10 um, of your witness statement and the second substantive paragraph, third line. You say, so we got to 20, we couldn't find anyone. Andy Harris has opened the door that goes into the hallway of 20, nothing fully smoke logged. Uh, I appreciate it's difficult at this remove, but can you remember at what time or uh, how long after you left the bridgehead you arrived at the 20th floor? Um, accu accurately, no. I think you'd be able to get that information from the uh, BA telemetry information it would tell you, show you a calming down in the breathing rate potentially of when we stopped at that floor. That's useful. Um, now, did you see Andy Harris open the door and go into the hallway of floor, tw floor 20? Yes. Um, how far into the lobby did he go? He just opened the door and uh, took one pace inside. The door was still a, still a job. Um, did he shout anything? And if so, what did he shout? Yeah, there was a, f a few of us shouting. I, I think he just shouted fire brigade, some along them lines. What were the conditions like, first of all, on the stairwell at floor 20? Smoky. Um, and when Andy opened that door, it let a lot of um, darker smoke into that uh, stairwell. And um, how hot was the smoke that came from the lobby into the stairwell? Uh, it was bearable. Now, um, at that stage, would it have been practicable for one or two or two members of your crew to break off and knock on each of the flat doors on floor 20? Uh, potentially, but I wouldn't have. Personally, I wouldn't have allowed that to happen. Um, um, to, to split a crew, I wouldn't have split the crew up. Not at that. <laughs> not after what we'd just done, the travel distance we'd just done and what we had to go back down. I don't think with the guys riding with me that night, we would have come to that decision. And so even though you were a crew of five, you wouldn't have split into, say, two component groups of two or three, for example? Um, I'd say no. Um, if I can look at turning back to page 10 and the second substantive paragraph, six lines down, Um, you say Andy Harris has opened the door that goes into the hallway of 20 nothing fully smoke logged firefighter Roberts had gone up one more floor to 21 and there she was she was lying on the mezzanine the stairs zigzag and she was on that zigzag there on the half landing between 20 and 21 um, so we had gone up there and she was lying on her back against the wall. She was coughing and spluttering. She was conscious and breathing, alert, knew what she was doing. I spoke to her and I asked, have you got anyone with you? No. 
anyone uh, left on your floor know. Um, why, taking each element of that, why did Andy Harris go up to the 21st floor, start to go up to the 21st floor on his own? No, uh, that's inaccurate. Andy opened the door on the 20th floor. We were in a, all bunched together on that, on that uh, landing. And Dino went to go and do this. Dean Roberts went to go and do the same thing on the 21st. Um, so in terms, when you say breaking up, we were literally from the distance of where I am to you. And how did you become aware of the woman in on the stairwell between the 20th and 21st floors? Uh, as Dean went from the 20th floor to the 21st, as the, the landings go back on themselves on the half landing, the lady was lying on the floor. You can't um, miss her. Did you or did any crew ask the woman which floor she had come from? No. Can you remember whether she had a cloth or a towel over her mouth or eyes? Uh, no. I, she had something around her head and I remember tying that around her uh, mouth and, and nose. And did you try and radio the bridgehead or entry control to say that you'd found a woman between the 20th and 21st floors and were bringing her down? Yeah, we did discuss getting comms down to the bridge, I guess. But I didn't personally send that message. OK. Were you able to get... Was the message able to get through to the bridgehead? I don't know. Um, you say um, further down in that paragraph, um, afterwards, <laughs> six lines up or thereabouts, afterwards I was a bit upset because I thought if she had come from 21 and 22, I asked her if there was anyone uh, on the floors, and she said no, and obviously I since found out there, there was people on the floors and people have died. But I asked her, as that is pretty normal, because if you find a casualty, you're meant to sweep round them and check. So I asked her, and she said uh, no. Um, you refer to a sweep around. What would that normally involve? Um, there I'm describing if you are searching, search and rescue, for, um, looking for casualties. If, if they're unconscious, you'd... Um, do a cursory search around them, because generally casualties can be found together with their loved ones. So you'd, you'd spread out um, and you'd try and search for the, anyone else with them. But obviously in this instance, the lady was conscious and breathing and talking. So I just asked her if she had anyone with her and if, if there was anyone else up there with her. But I'm not actually sure if she was a resident of that floor or if she came down from higher up or up from down below. I can't help you there, sorry. Mm. Um. Looking back now, at that stage of the night, would it have been practicable for some members of your crew to go onto the 21st floor and double check whether there were uh, any other people in flats up on that floor or not? Um, Dean Roberts did open the door to the 21st floor and the 22nd floor. Uh, and I think the 23rd floor, you have to ask him. And he did call out the fire brigade, anyone there. At that time, it was hot and smoky and when he opened them doors. And our firefighter media, which we took up with us, was inside the line bags, three or four floors below. So we had no, no protection from the, the heat and smoke and the fire. Can you give us an idea of any of the conditions as between the 20th and 21st floors? Uh, inside the hallways. Inside the hallways. Um, thick black smoke. Um, can I ask you to turn to page 11 and the third substantive paragraph, second line? Again, it's, it flows from the answer you've just given. Um, I think firefighter Roberts had gone up to 22 just to check the doorway in 22, and I could hear people shouting, fire brigade, fire brigade. So that was the boys doing that out of my crew, but no one made themselves known to us, and we didn't have the hose at that point. Now, this may be a question for Mr. Roberts himself, but when he came back, did you ask him if he'd knocked on any of the doors of the flats on uh, the 22nd floor? I didn't ask him that, no. Uh, did you ask him whether he'd kicked any of the doors? No. Uh, given um, the conditions you encountered uh, on the 20th and 21st floors, um, to what extent are you able to factor in the possibility that people within flats on those floors wouldn't be able to shout out or call for assistance? How do you factor that into your search and rescue plan? Sorry, can you explain what you mean? Yes. There may, it may well be that people, occupants of flats on the 20th, 21st, 22nd floors are, for some reason, unable to shout out or call for help. 
How do you factor that possibility into your search and rescue plan? Uh, well, you'd send crews specifically to those floors to search, search for residents of them flats. Our, our brief wasn't to do that, um, and because we'd already come across a casualty, um, we obviously had to bear that in mind in terms of time that this lady was um, inhaling the smoke. So it wasn't, and we couldn't we couldn't gain access to them halls really without the firefighter media. We needed to protect ourselves and them. So. Um, and put different. How do you factor that in? Um, we didn't factor that in. We just called. We called out. Uh, put, can I summarise your evidence this way? Please shout if this is unfair. <coughs> your priority was bringing the woman down to safety. Answer yes. Um, now, between pages 11 and 12 of your witness statement, you describe the journey down the tower. Could I ask you to turn to page 12 on the top of the uh, the page? Um, you see, you picked the lady up, stuck her on my shoulder, and I said, boys, we've got to move. And then you set out uh, what you did. Now, at that point, may I ask, are you trained to self-diagnose the symptoms of metabolic heat stress? Uh, yes, we are trained in that. Um, as you go further down um, page 12, <coughs> roughly halfway down, you say, I've tried to give her some air. I've taken my lid off, pulled my fascia aside, and I've tried to get my air to her. I've still got my neck loop on, the long one, so it's all just a mess. I try to put on a face that she has leant over his shoulder backwards, completely unconscious, and I'm trying to put this on her face, but it's just going everywhere. I started hyperventilating, and I took a couple of lungfuls of smoke in and just made it worse. So I put it on me and uh, put it uh, back on. Um, would it have helped if you'd had the spare oxygen mask, or the spare mask at that stage? Yes. Uh, given the height of the building, the conditions you encountered, on the basis of your experience on that night, uh, could the woman have been rescued from the 21st floor if firefighters had only had standard duration breathing apparatus? No. And if I may ask the obvious, uh, follow on from that, why? Uh, the travel distance was too long. I'm, I'm aware of some crews that did get to the, that height, but um, to bring a casualty down, uh, to be working that hard, bringing the casualty down, you just blow the set out too quick. You, you'd need the extended duration. Um, given your experience on the night, in particular the experiences bringing the woman down the tower, do you think if you'd remained on the 20th floor, or up indeed to the 21st and 22nd floors, you would have carried out a successful search of any flats? Without firefight immediate, no. Uh, would you have been able to carry or escort people down from the 20th, 21st, 22nd floors? I'd say as a crew of five, taking that lady down, who wasn't a particularly big lady, we were on the limit of what we could achieve. So maybe one other person. Any more than that, we could have got unstuck ourselves. One point which is, um, has been raised is whether it would have been possible to have firefighters in standard, du standard duration breathing apparatus waiting at the lower landings to help bring casualties down. Would that have been a practicable option on the night? Poten yeah, potentially, yeah. Um, could I ask you now to turn to page 13 of your witness statement and six lines from the bottom, uh, you say this, normally the heart, that's the hazardous ambulance response team, are always at these jobs and they always want to get involved, but they said they weren't allowed to go in tower jobs and they always want to get involved, but they said they weren't allowed to go in tower, so we had to get the casualties from the tower to them, which was another 150 metres, another minute, whatever, which was uh, annoying. Were you given a reason why Hart weren't allowed in the tower or move any closer to the tower? No. Um, could I ask Paul to bring up the telemetry data again? And if we're able to scan across to the furthest right, oh, sorry, leave it there. You'll see the end of wear time 221 and scanning slightly to the left to the tally into bodyguard 232. Do those times sound roughly right to you? Sorry, 
you brought up. Sorry, I've confused you. If you look at the so, end of wear column, yeah, and the bit that's highlighted, yeah, it says zero two twenty one. Yeah, the end of wear. It and sounds if, a bit short, but if, if that's what the telemetry is saying, then that's that's yeah. correct. Yeah. And if you scan to the left, and there's the tally in column. Yeah, that, that's accurate. There was a break in. Um, normally, when you withdraw, you'd pick up the tally straight away. Uh, we were performing CPR, so we didn't actually collect the tallies from the entry control board. So that would be the, the, the time between those two numbers. Now, you're concentrating on rescuing the woman, providing CPR, securing medical assistance. Um, when did you have the opportunity to return to the bridgehead? Would it have been at 2.32 or thereabouts? Um, I didn't actually pick up the tally. So me and Firefighter Roberts went back in. To the t as soon as we dropped that lady off to an ambulance crew, we went back into the tower. As we walked back in, um, crew manager Stern came out of another casualty, which we assisted him um, out with, again to the ambulance. Um, and then we went to go in again. But our colleagues of ours, Andy Harris and Russell Gonzalez, had gone in and picked up all the tallies for our whole team and were waiting outside at that point, and they basically waved the tallies at us, so we didn't go back in after that. Um, so you didn't have an opportunity to brief those at the entry control point or the bridgehead as the conditions you'd encountered? Not me personally, no. Uh, do you know whether any, any other members of your crew were able to give that update to people at the bridgehead or the entry control um, point? Well, there were Andy, Russell and uh, Phil came out with us, so I'm guessing. I can't give an accurate answer to that, but I assume, knowing Phil, he would have. And is it likely they would have provided an update as to the rescue of the woman you found between the 20th and 21st floors? Yes. Uh, could I ask you now to turn to page 16 of your statement? And at the top, um, the second paragraph uh, on that page, you discuss uh, fire yeah. Sorry, the survival guidance calls. Um, can you remember the name of the watch manager who is providing you with the slips of paper? Um, I can't give you his name. I don't know him personally. I know it was it's uh, Lambeth's governor, Lambeth's watch manager. Um, you saw Glyn Williams place slips of paper on the floor. Um, did you see anyone reporting to Mr. Williams the results of any rescue missions in response to an any FSG? No. Um, were you asked to relay any information back to the command unit, i.e. whether a crew had been deployed or the result of any search and rescue task? No, that wasn't my role. My role was just going from Lambeth's watch manager into the tower and I gave the, the FSGs to Glyn. So I, it's simply I, I, I a runner? Was a, yeah, it was a bit later in the chain. Um, can I ask you to turn to page 19 um, of your statement? And in the first substantive uh, paragraph on that page, you describe encountering a woman near the side exit that had been opened up uh, in the tower to allow firefighters and residents to escape safely. Um, you say roughly two thirds of the way down the page. Um, at this point, she is going mad, kicking, screaming. I saw Dino, so that's Dean Roberts, um, who is a big lad. And I said, Dino, give us a hand. And so he's grabbed her as well. We're trying to console her, but we're trying but we are saying she's got to get out. She said, my daughter, my daughter. So I said, where's your daughter? She said, we have come down from the 21st floor, flat 183, and he said, I'll tell them we will get your daughter. Can you remember what time this event happened now? I couldn't give you an accurate time, sorry. It's after the, the access from the tower, we were no longer going through the front. We were going through the side, and access had been broken through um, because of the debris falling. So in and around when that access was made, this lady um, was brought out. And my role was simply just to, I just took her from the bridge down through the debris, because there's a lot of debris falling and sharp objects and stuff on the floor. Um, do you know whether the message was passed regarding uh, this lady's daughter to anyone? It absolutely was, Dean, Dean did it. Uh, Dean did it, and do you know to whom he passed the message? I don't know the answer to that, but I have seen uh, the writing on the wall, 183, 21st floor, in white china graph, on the wall in the tower. 
it might well be we'll have a break in due course and it might well be we can bring up that photograph and we can discuss it further. Well, since you've raised it, Mr. Kinnear, how do you feel? Are you happy to keep going for a bit? Yeah, I'm fine. Thank you, sir. All right. Okay. Um, do you know yourself what steps were taken to rescue uh, this lady's daughter? No. Okay. Can you remember whether the lady referred to anyone else other than her daughter? No. Now, um, the next topic I'd like to discuss with you is your return um, inside the tower. And could I ask you to turn to page 20 and the fourth paragraph, line one, um, which starts, they asked for only EDBA wearers. They asked for only EDBA wearers to come forward. So we did, and they pushed us to go back in again. We went into another holding area. To get you into the building, two police officers would cover you with their shields to get you through the side entrance. We got to the front and they were like, have you been in before? And we were like, nah. And they were like, you have. And we were like, yeah, but um, we have, but we know where we are going. Now, um, if I could ask Paul to turn up the telemetry data again. And if we could look at box 191. There we see starting reading from left to right, uh, second BA where your name almost, I think surname spelt incorrectly. Yeah, that's inaccurate, sir. Um, after our initial wear, we went out and completed what's called an A test. We put fresh cylinders on the sets and we were told that we would not be going back in straight away without a, a long break because obviously the conditions and the, the work we'd done. So we left our sets uh, up by the leisure centre and on returning a bit later on, those sets had been taken by another crew. Right. So there was a lot of firefighters on the ground that can wear EDBA, so they'd taken them sets. So our second wear was slightly later than that, I think 6 a.m. And okay. we those sets came from PEG and we tested them on the scene. Okay, so if we just scan further over to the right, looking at the tally out time, it's five minutes past five, you think that's probably an hour or so later, is that right? Yeah, so the, these, the names written here, Dean, Andrew, Russell and myself, we didn't wear the sets at that time to because we've signed the book, it looks like they're our sets. I understand. But our second wear were from sets that came from stores. Mm. And so doing the best you can, you thought you re-entered the tower around 6 o'clock? or It was 6 a.m. when I went in, yeah. OK. Um, how can you be so certain? Because obviously it's difficult now remembering. Why uh, are you so I certain? Remember the sun, <laughs> I remember the sun coming up and thinking I'd better ring my wife. Um, Looking back at page 20, the final paragraph, uh, three lines from the bottom of the page, um, they gave us our brief, which was to take a TIC thermal imaging camera. And as we would go up, we'd come across some charged lengths of hose with a branch on. We were to take one of them and go to the 12th floor. We were to fight the fire uh, on the 12th floor, as we'd had, con had had contact with people on the 12th floor like an hour ago. They hadn't given up uh, on those people. Um, can you remember, at the time you were deployed on that particular task, where was the location of the bridgehead? Uh, the bridgehead was on the ground floor at the bottom of uh, the glass staircase. As you went up from the bridgehead, um, up the tower, can you describe conditions in the stairwell as you went from the third floor up? I'd say smoky the entire way. And how thick was that smoke? Um, I can't remember that. So Can you remember I remember the colour? smoke when we op opened the doors to the hallways, but not so much in the. You could see you could see the crews, the other crews, the 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 outlines of the other crews. What do you remember about the temperature of the stairwell at that time in the morning? Not much, sorry. No. Uh, when you reached the tenth floor, it's right that you found a body on the landing. Is that right? Uh, that's correct. I think I, in my statement it said it was a, a male, but I believe it to be a female casualty now. 
and uh, it is believed that the person you found was Khadija, Khadija Se from flat 173 on the 20th floor. Were you able to check for vital signs of life? Um, when we got up there, the, the crews that we uh, took over from had already done that, and I think that had been done a few times, but um, from my experience and seeing the lady in situ, um, it was fair to say that she, she was deceased. Could I now turn to a separate matter, and that's uh, hoses and other firefighting equipment. Uh, you mentioned at various points in your statement that hoses and other firefighting kit were left in the stairwell. Do you know what efforts were made during the course of the night to clear uh, that equipment from the stairwell? No. Would it have been practicable to have removed hoses, etc., discarded equipment from the stairwell? Um, where I've described hose there in my statement, that, that's, that's charged lengths of hose, so crews are using that to firefight, so we, we needed that in there. But as you went up the stairwell, was there other hoses, discarded hoses, discarded equipment on the stairwell? I wouldn't, at that I wouldn't say discarded, all the hose was charged, which means it's under pressure, it's full of water. Um, and as far as, to my knowledge, it was being used, so it wasn't discarded. So it's only operative kit that you came across as you went up? Yeah, I didn't see anything else other than hose, really, on the staircase. Uh, as you went up, can you remember whether <coughs> the doors uh, from the stairwell to the lobbies were open or closed? Um, on, the, on the floors that I was on, 11, uh, 10, 11 and 12, they were closed. Uh, can I now ask you about a separate topic, and that's stay put advice. And could I ask you to turn to page 24 um, in the statement? And I think it's the second paragraph on that page. It's difficult to see with these statements. In the middle of the night, when we were stood on the grassy area by the sports uh, call, is that hall? It's meant to be rather than call. A message came over the radio on Channel 1 that said all firefighters and ground personnel to be aware that we have now advised the, the residents to self-evacuate. Time-wise on, that I don't know. Three, four in the morning, maybe. That definitely came over the handheld radios that they, that they told people to get out. Um, can you remember now whether this was the only message uh, about change from the state court advice that you heard on the radios during the course of the night? There may be more, but that, that is the one that I recall at that time. I don't think that time's accurate to be able to get that data somewhere else, but I specifically remember that coming over the handheld radio, all fibre down personnel being made aware that people have been told to self-evacuate now. Thank you, Mr. Gillen. Um, so I've come to the end of that uh, section of questions. It might be a useful time for a break um, for yes. five or ten minutes um, to see whether there are any further matters arising, and, uh, which, and then we can put them to Mr. Gillen. Right. Do you have further questions yourself? I might do in respect of, the, the, yes, of the, the, um, the, the China graph. <clears throat> right. Well, we'll have a break now, Mr. Gillen. Uh, please don't talk to anyone about your evidence or anything related to it over the break. Yep. And um, we'll resume at quarter past 12, please. Oh, thank you, sir. If you'd like to go with the usher, she'll look after you. Good. 12.15 then, please.
Thanks, sir. All right, Mr Gillam. Yes, sir. Thank you. I think possibly a few more questions. Thanks, sir. Uh, Mr Gillam, thank you very much for your patience. We're nearly done, so the end is in sight, but I'd be grateful for your help on a few more points. No worries. Um, first of all, we were discussing um, whether the uh, lady's message regarding her daughter, flat 183, was communicated, and you rightly referred to markings on a wall. Um, could I ask Paul to turn up MET 15815? Now, if we look at the left hand, left hand side, now, are you able to identify 183, four lines down in the top left hand corner? Yes. And reading from left to right. One eight, I think one eight three, floor twenty one. Are you able to? Are you able to decipher the script further to the right? Um, I think that says B A, and then F. Do you know what F might stand for? I'm assuming fatality. And if we could pull further towards the left. You'll see in the middle, in large capitals, FSG at 2.15. Given that you emerged from the tower at 20 minutes past two, and that was already on the board, is it likely, in your view, that it was an FSG, the FSG call had been received before uh, you encountered the lady? Uh, uh, that's answer that's yes. That's probably a wrong action. Answer yes. Well, I'm just wondering, did you actually see this wall, Mr Gillan? Yeah, I was, I was about to say, this isn't the, the wall I was um, referring to. Could I ask you, right. I was coming on to that. The next uh, photograph might be more useful, 15816. Is that what you saw? Answer yes. And in the top right hand corner we can all see 183 daughter 21 or 22 that's categorically that is what i saw and um, that is what you saw on the night after you'd spoken to the lady answer yes thank you uh, mr gillam can i go back to asking you um, about training and uh, what training you received at paddington um, what training did you receive in respect of um, the particular risks and procedures relating to high-rise firefighting? Um, we would just do practical drills in the yard and theoretical input on a PowerPoint um, when that came around on the training diary. So at routine intervals, I couldn't tell you when we would do input, but it was given by the watch manager on the risks and techniques associated with high-rise firefighting. Uh, did they involve a lecture on breach of compartmentation and what to do should a breach occur? No. Uh, did you have anything which covered uh, the particular risks posed by external cladding in high-rise fires? No. Do you recall any lecture on phenomena such as the Coanda effect, for example? Yes, we are trained in the Coanda effect, yes. And what are you taught in that regard? Just uh, the behaviour of, of it, what, what it entails um, and how it can act. Um, as far as I can remember, yeah. Uh, do you recall any lectures that dealt with vertical and lateral fire spread and how best to combat that? That is the Coanda effect, isn't it? Uh, well, it, sometimes it's viewed more broadly. There seems to be right. a, uh, some, um, some witnesses are given a particular a, answer and some are given a general answer. Yeah, I couldn't give you a specific okay. time or date that I would have done a, a package on that if we did. Do you recall any lecture that dealt with how best to affect partial or total evacuation from high-rise buildings in the event of a fire? No. Um, going back to the kit and equipment that you have on an FRU, um, would it carry emergency lighting? Yes. Um, well, it carries 
Uh, the the reels t and to set up the lighting and the lighting, yes. OK. And uh, was that lighting deployed on the evening? Um, no. It, the lighting carried on the fire rescue unit is um, powered by a generator. Um, so you'd have to get the cable reels up through the tower. So that was not done. Um, on the pumping appliances, we carried battery-powered lighting, which would have been better. Okay. Um, could or should, um, or rather, on the evening, would it have been practical to set up emergency lighting to assist uh, people knowing, for example, in the stairwell to aid visibility? I'd say yes, that could have been done, but at the time I was in there, it wasn't. Okay. Um, does an FRU carry um, equipment such as an emergency extractor? As in smoke extractor? Yes. No. no. Um, would it carry kits such as axes that could be used to force entry into flats, for example? Um, axes and breaking in gear are carried on all frontline firefighting appliances, not FIUs. Uh, did you take up an axe? Uh, no. No. Um, the next topic um, I'd like to cover with you is the question of second masks for BA sets. Um, you mentioned in evidence that it was a colleague who connected a second mask to his BA set. Um, do you remember who it was? Um, Harry Bettinson, um, James Wolfenden, Guy Tillotson and Ben Gallagher were part of a crew that, who I know on my watch who performed that rescue using uh, second person connection. Um, you um, gave evidence regarding a conversation you had between firefighters Mills and Campbell uh, on the stairway. Um, Mills has said in his evidence that he told the FRU crew that his task, their task was to rescue a woman from flat 175. Um, can you remember whether they specifically referred to flat 175 or not? He could have done, but I don't remember. Uh, only three more questions now, uh, Mr. Gillum. Um, first of all, dealing with the MDT, um, I asked you uh, a question regarding its reliability, and you said it's normally uh, pretty reliable. We're going to hear uh, evidence from Dean Roberts later on this afternoon, and he says that, uh, quotes, the, the MDT often fails. Um, does that reflect your experience? Do you agree with him? Um. Personally, I've, I've, I've found it pretty reliable, but I, I sit in the back. Um, Dino's done a bit of acting up, so he, he would use it more than I would. Um, we discussed together the, the feasibility of the initial task you were given, i.e. to get to the roof, and you, in your statement, uh, said you felt it was doable, to quotes. Could I ask you to turn to your contemporaneous note? Um, I think it's behind the second tab in your blue bundle. And it's three quarters of the way down the first page, uh, where you say, we knew at this start. Stage, I think. Apologies, sir. I think it's stage, isn't it? Stage, sorry. Uh, that the conditions would be too bad on the roof, and that we wouldn't have enough air to make it back down, and that uh, using line was not an option. Now, uh, looking back, is the what you set out in your contemporaneous note, it appears to be a more negative assessment of the prospects of the tasks to the roof? Um, I think that's why I paused at the start when you asked me if they were, the, this was accurate. I'd say a lot of this should be disregarded because I've just come off of a job that I was on for uh, nearly 12 hours, obviously not not sleeping that day either, so and obviously still high on adrenaline, so I just wrote this as quick as I could to get out of there, to be honest. So the ref fairer reflection of your view is that which you set out in your statement rather than the contemporaneous? Yes. Uh, finally, uh, there's the question of the weight of the FSG um, equipment that you carried for the roof task. How heavy was the four or five bags of equipment you used? Sorry, you said FSG equipment? FRU. FRU equipment, sorry. sorry. How heavy was all the gear? Because I think you said you were carrying four or five bags of equipment. Uh, yeah, not me personally. I carried a bag which had um, matrix harnesses in it. I also put two or three lengths of 45 mil hose in there and a branch. 
So that bag may have weighed maybe 40 to 50 kilo. The total kit, we've got two line bags, um, a large bag which has got all the pulleys and systems in it, two line bags, that, the harnesses um, and the hose. I'd say between the five of us, maybe around 70 to 80 kilos. Um, this may be an unfair question. Are you able to say how much heavier that kit is than the kit a firefighter carrying SDBA that would be carrying? Well, if, he's, if, he's, if they're not carrying any line gear, quite a bit. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Mr Gillam, thank you very much for your time and patience this afternoon. It's much appreciated. Well, Mr Gillam, it just remains for me to thank you very much for coming to give us your evidence. It's always very helpful to hear what was going on inside the tower, and we're very grateful to you for coming along. Thank you very much, and now you're free to go. Yes. Now then, Mr Keneal. Sir, there's one final witness uh, for us today, um, Mr Dean Roberts. Yes. He's travelling down from North Wales today. Um, I think he was assuming a two o'clock start, and so I don't think he's yet with us. Yes. Only just with us. So, so in the circumstance... Well, was he told uh, he would be on at two o'clock? I, I think there was an assumption, or he was told, well, that's yes. that's all right. I mean, um, in, that, in that case, I don't suppose he's quite ready to be shot into the witness box. I suspect he's not. No. Well, can you give me any idea how long you think you might require with him? An hour or so. So we could take an early lunch, come back at two o'clock without fear of overrunning the day? Yes. Good. <laughs> well, that's what we'll do then. Um, Thanks, sir. Well, you've heard that Mr Roberts is coming, but he's not expecting to give evidence until two o'clock. I think it would be a bit discourteous to try and start him before lunch. So we'll break now. And we'll resume at 2 o'clock when we expect to see Mr Roberts. Thank you very much. Thank you.